It's 1985, and 42-year-old George Jung is on the lam in Miami. His cocaine-fueled success has come crashing down around him. He didn't enjoy being a fugitive this time because he didn't have any money. It was all down in Panama. He had no way of getting it. George has $68 million stashed away in a numbered account. All he has to do is pull one last job just to make enough cash for a plane ticket to Panama. He's about to find out that times have changed. All of the cocaine that George moved into the States helped create a glut in the market. To sell it, dealers converted the powder into crack, a smokable form of cocaine. It was cheap, only $2 per hit. The crack epidemic hits the city streets. A disease consuming America from within. Even Mirtha has fallen prey and has become a full-on crackhead. This was a period of, of great changes in the federal government's attitude uh, toward drugs. Remember in 1982, Reagan declared his famous war on drugs and states started jacking up the penalties for it. And if you're ever offered drugs, please, please, just say no, just say no. But the government's new attitude toward drugs, the just say no to drugs campaign, meant absolutely nothing to George. He was going to do um, this last deal come hell or high water. George is so obsessed with his stockpile of cash that he can't see the forest for the trees or the enemies hiding among his so-called friends. George made his way to Fort Lauderdale and through his old contacts, he found a couple of people who were interested in transporting for him, Tom and Greg. Together, they hatch a scheme to make a big run down to Columbia. On May 25th, 1985, after three months of planning, the plane takes off for Columbia from Fort Lauderdale and returns with 300 kilos of pure, high-grade cocaine. In George's mind, the whole operation went smoothly. They uh, celebrated into the night with champagne, and, uh, and George snorted a, a good deal of their import. In reality, of course, Tom and Greg were part of an undercover drug task force. George fell fast asleep on the floor underneath his coat. The next thing he was aware of were, again, windows crashing in, doors falling to the floor, sound of uh, glass all over the place, and these large guys all pointing uh, guns at him and yelling, get up, you scumbag, you drug dealer, you're under arrest, uh, Florida State Police, Fort Lauderdale Police, DEA. For George Jung, the party is finally over. George is indicted in federal court with the new tougher penalties mandated by the war on drugs. He's looking at a 60-year stretch in jail. George was sitting in prison thinking this really was the end of the line until uh, one of the um, federal agents came in to talk with him saying, you know, we really want somebody else a lot more than we want you. Carlos Later is on, on top of our list. But before George can help, on February 4th, 1987, Later is arrested and extradited to the U.S. from Colombia. The feds offer George immunity if he'll testify against Carlos, but he has a hard time thinking of himself as a rat. He quickly changes his mind when he finds out that all the money he had stashed away in Panama has disappeared commandeered by Manuel Noriega's corrupt government. One of the saddest days in George's life when he was sitting in the prison in Miami was to, uh, was to find out that, that he no longer owned $68 million. There wasn't a penny left. In 
In November 1987, under heavy security, Carlos Lader goes on trial. Just before Thanksgiving, George takes the stand and calmly relays the finer points of their volatile partnership and the history of the cocaine boom in the United States. The consummate storyteller is an entertaining and concise witness. George spent three days on the stand and he dazzled them. Later is found guilty of smuggling and sentenced to life without parole. In exchange, George was given his freedom. He was not on parole, he was free to go. He didn't owe the government any time or service. He went back to Massachusetts and for a while tried to leave a straight life. But George had never done anything else as an adult but smuggle drugs. Soon after his release, George begins dealing marijuana again and slowly builds another business. This time, however, law enforcement doesn't take very long to catch on. In 1994, the year after the book Blow is published, he is caught importing several hundred pounds of marijuana from Mexico. He is sentenced to 22 years for smuggling. Now in his 60s, George Jung is serving his time at the Fort Dix Correctional Institution in New Jersey. His quest for success has carried a heavy price. It's cost him his freedom, and it has helped create a drug problem in the United States that engulfs thousands of lives each year. But George Jung has a different view of the situation. In no way did George even see himself as immoral. Selling drugs to people who wanted drugs, in his mind, wasn't, wasn't a crime at all. George was a follower of what he liked to uh, describe as uh, existentialism. He loved to go on about Nietzsche, but when you ask George what he meant by being an existentialist, uh, he came out one night with, well, it's simple enough. You do what you want to do.